I straighten my hair today. I live in a quiet part of Montreal, but it is loud. Alright, let's do this. Hello fellow humans, welcome to the Nerdy Fox. I'm Steph, and if you're new, welcome to my channel, and if you're returning, welcome back. Yes, that's right, it is another book review, and I'm not sure if anybody else noticed, but book reviews are on Sundays, so I'm calling it Book Review Sunday. Today I will be talking about the Milkweed Trilogy by Ian Tregellis. And if you look below at my notes, it's actually something else. Reading Mushroom, could you please tell me how to pronounce that? Oh, hello. It's uh, your friendly neighborhood art professor, Professor Dr. Laura. Uh, today I want to talk about the word Tryptychon, um, which is uh, a term that uh, comes from ancient Greek, which means something like folded trice or a three-layer picture. So um, this term is a term used in art and a triptychon or triptych, which is the English uh, version of the word, is usually described to, um, are usually used to describe a picture in three parts. So like you can imagine on an altar where you have your centerpiece and then the um, doors that are open and closed. So to show you an example, this is a, so these are two pieces of the triptychon by Hieronymus Bosch. Those are the wings and then you have to imagine like a centerpiece in the middle. So this is, I think it's paradise and hell. So they um, belong together, those pieces. Um, but there is also here, I have a, a more modern example. So this piece is um, by Otto Dix and it shows the um, metropolis in the 1920s. So full of parody and stuff. Yeah, um, but that's all I wanted to tell you today and bye. These books are alternate history based during World War II. Well, actually, the first book is World War II. So I'll, I'll quickly go over the synopsis of all three books. I'll be very vague because this will be spoiler free. The first book we get a little bit of background prior to World War II, just kind of the history of some of the main characters. So we find out Marsh was a hoodlum that was taken in by this wonderful man called Stevenson. He was part of, I think, the Air Force. I could be wrong. He, he was, you know, working for the military, basically, and he helped Marsh. Instead of being a hoodlum kid, you know, he got him into college and then now he works for MI6 with Stevenson. And we find out a little bit about Will, who is an aristocrat. I was going to say aristocrat. <laughs> he is an aristocrat and his family life is not that great. We also find a little bit of history of Klaus and Gretel, who are two orphan children, which I, the way that they talk about it, I think they were probably gypsies. I, I'm not sure exactly, I'm horrible at these things because they were using a lot of racial slurs for them, so I don't want to, you know, say what they said, but basically they are two young orphans that get picked up by this guy who basically sells them to this Nazi scientist to do experiments on. Anyway, so that's a little bit of the history of kind of the main players of the story. So he meets up with somebody um, and they and he gets information from them. But as they're kind of exchanging information and he's trying to get out of the German side, he wants sanctuary with, with the UK, with the British Army, and then he gets burned alive and it doesn't make sense to Marsh, and, and it really, really doesn't. He gets back to MI6, he shows this film strip that he got from that person, and basically it's children and young, like teenagers and young adults doing very fantastical things that are impossible. And Milkweed gets created, which is a special part of the government that only answers to the Prime Minister. Because of the fantastical things Marsh sees on this film strip, he calls his friend Will because they were college buddies and one drunken night Will mentioned, oh by the way, my family's warlocks. My, my father was a warlock, my grandfather was a warlock. 
by the way. So it was a one drunken night. So he ends up calling Will going, hey, listen, I saw this thing. Do you think it could be the thing that you told me about? So Will sees the film strip, he's not sure. So they decide to call, a, you know, the Eidolans, which, okay, I'm gonna get into all of that. But basically that's how it starts. And you're following Klaus and Gretel and a couple of other kids that have these things. So in a nutshell, in the first book, the British army calls on the warlocks to help them with the war and the German side has these children that have been experimented on with this thing called the Willenskrieg. They, they have to be connected to a battery and they use willpower to have these fantastical powers. Like one kid, he can dematerialize. A young girl, she can make herself invisible. One, guy, one boy, he could, um, you know, create fire. And Gretel, who, one of my favorite villains of all time, <laughs> She can see the future. And you don't actually really know how, you just know that she, everything that's happening, she already knows it's gonna happen. And, and she is plotting things to go the way she wants to go. We do not know what she wants to happen, but you see that. And so that's the first book. The second book, you it is 20 years after the war, or no, 22 years after the first, uh, the Second World War ends, and it's 1963. Think about that. Think about that. It is showing what the consequences of decisions that were made during the Second World War, uh, what that looks like for the world in you know 20 years later and once again alternate history nothing happens the way we know it had happened so yes so that's the second book and the third book is we go back to the second world war <laughs> and i'm not going to say how i'm not going to say why because that would be giving up the whole entire story okay what I love about this book, number one, the magic and alchemical systems, I wanna say, because the warlocks that are used is not a magic system I've ever heard of before. Basically, warlocks are negotiators. They do not have magic themselves. They speak a language called the Nokian that the Eidolans also speak, and th that's the only way you can talk to the Eidolans. Now, what are the Eidolans? I'm gonna do a horrible job explaining what this is, but basically it is the creatures that live in between. Time and space means nothing to them. And if you wanna negotiate, like if you want help with something and you ask the Eidolans, there is a blood price. And guess what? The, sh the bigger the favor is the more blood they need and it is explained why they want a blood price i'm not i'm not even going to explain why because i think that was only really explained halfway through the second book so i'm not even going to tell you but i gotta say very interesting and then on the german side i heard i think they said alchemical once. And the reason why I'm using that term is because there's another trilogy that Intergellis did called Alchemy Wars, and it was also great. I prefer this one, but anyway. So I'm just gonna, because it's not magic, it is blatantly said what the Germans are doing with these kids are, is not magic. This mad scientist took a bunch of kids, shoved them into these incubators, basically they're tiny small boxes, and through alchemical and, 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 and electrical ways, through their willpower, they were able to have this power. So, and the way that it's explained is, when they're in that incubator, the children, whatever their huge fear was, it, 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 it manifested into this power like for example klaus just wanted to get out of the box like claustrophobia at its best he just wanted to get out of the box he can dematerialize for reinhardt he was so cold in the box manifest firepower gretel gretel 
Gretel's different than all the other kids. So that's how the Germans have that Willenskrip. I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong, but you know. But yes, I thought that was also fascinating. It really shows how during war specifically, how the lines of good and evil kind of go into a gray area. But this book shows you that some really shitty decisions have to be made and there are sacrifices. And it's, you know, coming from a person who doesn't have to protect a whole entire nation, I could be like, oh, that's horrible. But in reality, when, when you're dealing with war, it, it's okay. If I have to sacrifice X amount, but I get to save X amount, you know, these are the tough decisions that they have to make. It is a wild ride. I will also say it is not for the faint of heart. Another reason why I love this book is Ian Tregellis is not afraid to hurt the main characters in the worst possible ways. There is something about not being light on what can happen to people, especially during the war. And also Gretel, like I said, one of the greatest villains in of all time for me. She is evil, psychotic, a sociopath, and I just loved her character. I thought she was a wonderful villain. It was phenomenal. Also, the third book, going back to the first book, another thing I also really like is when certain things that didn't make sense in the first book all of a sudden make absolute sense in the third book and everything is explained and not everything is perfect. So that's my review. If you like alternate history, please pick this up. If you like stories about World War II, please pick this up. If you like different magic systems, please pick this up. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. And if you like my face, please hit the subscribe button. And I'll see you next time. Bye.